Greetings, this is Cordell Davenport. In this video, I'm going to persuade you into investing in apartments. And to get my point across, I developed this presentation you are now seeing called Don't Take the Stock Market Bus. Instead, drive yourself to cash flow and tax write offs with ap apartments. I once had a conversation with a good friend. <clears throat> His name is Don. And I told him, Man, you can't argue with logic. He said, false. My wife does it all the time. Now, the concept and logic of when you talk to somebody, trying to use reasoning with them, it goes a lot way. It goes a long way, that is, in life. And it helps us understand things on the reasons why. So in this video, I'm not going to throw out a million statistics to you. I'm going to do my best to use logic. And you will learn why and how investing in apartments over stocks, it brings cash flow monthly and tax write-offs compared to stocks. And with apartment investing, you create your future. Now, to do this, I'm going to tell you a true story about a guy by the name of Alex Spaniels who created Opportunity. <clears throat> you see, his father had 17 siblings. And his father grew up poor in Greece. And he came to America for opportunity, like a lot of people did in 1920s. So he left his village and entered America with $20 in his pocket. He ended up getting a job with his cousin at a restaurant, and eventually he ended up buying that restaurant. He went back to Greece, got him a wife, and then he moved to Stockton, California. And that is where Alex was born. And he was born in 1923, a couple years before the Great Depression. And what Alex did as a youth is that at like eight years old, he will work before going to school. He made donuts. He washed dishes, he says. And because of the Great Depression, this father's restaurant closed down. And later on in life, his dad opened up another bakery. And Alex still worked for his dad. And he was now married to the lady, Faye, by the name of Faye. And after getting married, they lived in his parents' house for about seven months and then later moved into his own place. It had one room and the bed came out of the wall. It was a Murphy bed. Rent was only 40 bucks a month. And although it was a small uh, place where they lived, he felt a pride of ownership. <clears throat> so this is a book. He wrote an autobiography. I read this was about. 2005 or so and I took a lot of notes on it and so I'm going to quote what he said in his book he said that uh, for some people maturity comes with age for me it developed with responsibility I never realized that I was fully accountable for my actions until 1950 when my oldest son Dean was born the responsibility I felt for him was powerful for the first time I began to realize that I had my own family separate and apart from my father's and that I alone was responsible for making a good life for them. I was 26 years old when Dean was born. Up until that point, my life had been simply a succession of events taken for granted. I was flighty, doing this, doing that. Life didn't mean much beyond my own needs and desires. Dean's birth enriched my life. What's a sense of meaning and purpose that I had never experienced before? I had a son to look after. And with this birth came the realization that my future had become inextricably tied to his. The surge of pride and joy I felt looking at my son infused me with renewed energy. I worked harder and longer. Now, he has a second child on the way. And he knew that um, his living conditions was not adequate. It was too small. He needed a bigger place. And with that, he needed more money. So the $40 a week he was getting was not cutting it. So his father was very strict and harsh, he said, and that he believed everything was going his wanted to go his way. <clears throat> Dad was very stubborn. Alex said that he worked for three years without a day off. Well, so one day he got enough courage to approach his dad to tell him that he needs an extra $35 a week to support his family. 
His dad did not allow him to express himself fully. He put his hand up like, ah, I don't want to hear it, waved his hand in dismissal, and went back to work. So Alice got home that night and told his wife, you know, I want to quit. And he told, this is a direct quote, we had nothing, nothing in the bank, not even a real house to live in. At 25, Faith was eight months pregnant with our first daughter, with one child at home and another on the way. There are a lot of things she could have said. She could have asked me how I expected to support her and the children. She could have infused me with fear about the uncertainty of unemployment, but she didn't. You have to meet my wife to really know the inspiration that woman has given me. She looked at me with one baby to feed and another on the way, living in a one room apartment with no guarantee of anything. And she said, Alex, you do what you think is best for all of us. Faye's confidence gave me the strength I needed to stand up to my father. The next morning, Alex told his dad he wanted to raise, he wanted to raise and told him that if he didn't get it, he was out. He go work somewhere else and he's, he's going to leave. His dad showed no response and said nothing. Two weeks later, Alex quit. When he walked out, his dad said, you, you're going to quit? You're going to crawl back here on your hands and knees begging for this job. Alex replied, if I have to come back here on my hands and knees, I just shoot my brains out. Now, Alex did not talk to his dad for two years after that. He told that one day he would show him. At the time, he didn't have a clue what to do next. It seemed like he was stuck. When his daughter was born, he had no money, no job, and he couldn't even pay the $210 to get his daughter out the hospital. When, to, when, when he went to go borrow money from his family, he was denied because of what happened with his dad. He ended up having a friend co-sign a loan for him. Now, a month later, he still had no work, no ideas of what to do for work. What he did know was that he would never work a regular nine to five job because of working for his father left him bitter. Now he wanted to be the man. Now he wanted to be the boss. So he looked at all the skills that he possessed. He can open up a restaurant because of the high costs. So he figured baking and delivering donuts to farm workers was the best option in Stockton and realized that if workers wanted donuts for breakfast, it will make a lot of sense for them to want sandwiches for lunch. So that's exactly what he did. He figured out that selling bologna was the best choice for meat because it was cheap. All that he needed was a truck. He figured he needed 1500 to launch his catering business. There was a branch manager at a bank that he knew, and the person at the bank told him he can only give him a loan for $800 because anything above that would need authorization. So he worked out a way where the farmers who owned the land would buy the sandwiches for their workers and minus the cost out of their pay. He sold 250 sandwiches a day. And in the process of making the sandwiches, he would get farmers asking him if he knew where to get more workers. Now, he thought, hmm, the more workers, the more sandwiches he could sell. And after further reflection, he thought, if he could bring food to the farms, why couldn't he also bring workers to the farm? And he researched and found out there was a town in Mexico where a lot of laborers had migrated from in the past. And the immigration laws back then were nothing like how they are today at all. Now, the government, the U.S. government, encouraged workers from Mexico to come up and go back to Mexico after the harvest was complete. Like I said, totally different right now of how it is. <clears throat> so Alex is 27 years old. He decided to go to the town and get some workers. He got on a bus from Stockton and went down to Mexico. It took him 18 hours and the bus had no air condition with 106 degree weather. He had only 20 bucks in his pocket. He said the same amount that his dad had when he came from Greece. He got a room for $2 a night. He said, I had no plan, no contacts, and absolutely no idea how to recruit farm labor. I had taken a trip on faith. That faith immediately paid off.
One thing about Alex, he has so much confidence, I really admire. But what he did, he started asking around for farm labor. And ironically, in that same hotel, there was a meeting for farmers seeking workers. He went to the meeting, uninvited, and only knew a little bit of Spanish. And there was a man speaking to the crowd. And um, Alex stood near him as he was talking. The man asked him who he was, where he was from, what he was doing there. Alex said he wanted to bring workers to Stockton, farmers. It turned out that the guy was also from Stockton. He told Alex to meet him the next morning at 6 a.m. The next day, he told Alex he needed housing for 350 workers and asked if he knew where he can house them. Here is this confidence thing once again kicking in for Alex. Now, he said, I had no earthly idea where to house 30 men, much less 350. He asked Alex, where is it at? Alex said, don't worry about it. You'll like it when you see it. The guy said, you mentioned you were in the restaurant business. Alex said, yeah. The guy said, well, I have to find somebody to feed all these people. Can you handle it? Alex thought, I cannot worry about the details, including what he and the farmers would pay him. Then uh, the important thing was not to let this opportunity slip away. He replied, I'll take care of that too. No problem. The guy told Alex he would see him back in Stockton in four days. Alex said, no sweat. When you come back, I'll have everything ready for you. Now, <clears throat> Alex had to come back to Stockton from Mexico. Back on an 18-hour bus ride. He thought about what had happened. He said, only 24 hours before, I had nothing. Now I was returning home with a verbal contract for a business bigger than anything I ever, ever imagined. When he got back, he told his wife the news, and she recommended that they visit the county fairgrounds. He found a building on the grounds that could house the 350. The director of the fair was actually a family friend. He didn't have the money to pay for the rent at the moment, but he would get it later. The director told him, don't worry about it. Pay me when you get it. The guy from Mexico came with 350 workers, came, and he loved what he saw. Alex located another family friend who owned a surplus store. There he got 350 beds, blankets, pillows, enough kitchen equipment to feed 350 men. And within 30 days, Alex said everything came together. Alex said, the farmers paid me $1.75 per day, per man. My cost was 75 cents per man. After making breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I still profited per man, per day, $1 every day per man. Now, for 90 days, I housed and fed the farm workers. By December, when the harvest was over and I paid all my bills, he said, I had $35,000 in the bank. Four months after walking out my father's bakery, I had more money than I had made in 20 years of baking, he said. Think about that. Within one year, he enhanced his operation to put the workers in the airport barrack, still in Stockton, now serving 1,500 people. Five years after quitting his dad's bakery, he was preparing 7,000 meals a day, making 60% profit. That year, he had cleared almost $700,000, which was a stream amount of money back in 1956. I don't know what that is now, but that's a lot of money to be back then. Now, his accountant told him that he should invest in real estate to take advantage of the tax write-offs. He did so with developing and investing in apartments. Well, as they say, the rest is history. Alex grew his real estate empire for his whole family. He even bought the San Diego Chargers, which are now the Los Angeles Chargers. And he died in 2018 at the age of 95. And at the end of this book, he signed off with this, and I thought it was admiring. He said, I didn't start off to fulfill a get-rich fantasy. All I sought was security and peace of mind for my family. That was the goal. The rest occurred because of hard work, but I could not accomplish much without my wife, Faye, and our children. Very humbling. 
Now, you may not have a problem making so much money, you need to have real estate tax write-offs, but the principle still applies. Now, notice the CPA didn't say <clears throat> to Alex to buy stocks instead of real estate. The beauty of investing in real estate, particularly in apartments, that is if it's bought right, it will generate monthly cash flow and provide tax write-offs. When Alex got back to Mexico to Stockton, remember, he didn't have the money for the fairground. He borrowed it. He used leverage. The same rule applies to real estate. If a property costs 500000 you can get a loan to cover 80% of the value. You can't go to the bank and say you want a loan of $500,000 worth of stocks. That's not happening. <clears throat> now, let's talk about logic on write-offs. So the tax laws are written to support business owners and investors who create jobs and housing. The laws benefit the risk takers and doers who help grow the economy. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction and reduces taxable income from the investment property. But in contrast to property taxes, mortgage interest, utilities, insurance, it doesn't require any cash outlay. The depreciation expense deduction can result in a positive cash flow becoming a loss for tax purposes. Now, most investment properties go up in value every year, but on paper, their value is going down due to depreciation. Tax write-offs. Now, see, the IRS uses depreciation to acknowledge that an asset wears down over time. And the number that they have determined for apartment buildings is 27.5 years. So this is like a paper loss. So this is a straight line deduction. Whatever the value is, you divide it by 27.5, and that is what you're allowed for deduction per year. So it means like you don't spend any money, but you still get the expense. And this helps offset the money. So let's say you bought a $2 million apartment building, held it for 27.5 years. As I said, you divide that up by the $2 million, 27.5. There you go. Write-offs. Now, when you sell a rental uh, investment, it's very likely that you have to recapture the depreciation and pay taxes on it down the road. And this is called like recapture real estate depreciation. And sometimes it could be around 25%. And FYI, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a lawyer. So here's my little disclaimer. So everything I'm saying, back it up on your own research. I should have said that in the beginning, but whatever. All right. So uh, there's this thing called 1031 exchange. There's a lot of opportunity there as well. And that's a whole new conversation about that. You can do some research online, but basically you can take your equity and you can apply it and uh, to other bigger properties and you just have a tax defer. And if you die, you don't pay any taxes. It just goes to your, your kin, whoever is a part of your, um, your network, your family and so forth. All right. So if you earn money at a normal salary job, you have to pay taxes. Now, rental income is not a part, is not subject to Social Security and Medicare tax. So if you earn $100,000 in rental income, you void tax completely from the money that you are earning from the income from the property. That's kind of a cool thing. All right, so I want you to understand Apartment investing is a business as with every business, you're entitled to certain write-offs. So as you can see here, some of the different types of write-offs that can be applied. So I'm just going to pause for about mm, 15 seconds and let you read through this list. You can skim through it. You can pause this video if you like. I'll just give you some time to look at that right quick as I sip my coffee. All right, moving on, you guys. Now, here's some more logic about cash flow. 
With apartment investing, you create the opportunity. That's it in the introduction. Now you can lower expenses. You can increase profits. With being an apartment owner, you drive where you want to go. You are in control. You determine the destination. You determine who gets in your car. Now, unlike stocks, you don't control anything on the performance of the stocks. You are basically on the bus with the route you can't control. You basically have to sit there, look out the window. The only decision you can make is when to get on and get off the bus. With stocks, you make no business decisions. You can only decide when to buy and when to sell. Now, here is some logic on apartment investing, why it's smart for you. Your bank will make sure the numbers make sense. If the property doesn't cover a minimum of 20% or more than what the mortgage is, they won't finance the purchase. When you want to buy an apartment building, you can't negotiate the price. You can get seller financing where the person you are buying from will give you a loan from the equity of the property. And so instead of you having to come up with 20% down payment, the owner can give you a loan of 10%. The owners will like that because it will be a lower tax for them on the sale. With stocks, whatever the computer screen tells you is the price, that is what you pay. You can't negotiate it. You can't go to the bank and get a loan to buy stocks. When you borrow 90% of a payment on a property, it doesn't mean that you own 10%. You own 100% and you get 100% tax deductions. You will have predictable income. You can control expenses and revenue. You can have a property manager. All you do is manage a property manager and they deposit the rent in your account. You can enforce business decisions. Apartments have insurance in case disaster strikes on a property. There is no type of insurance on stocks. Companies go out of business and go bankrupt. Look at uh, George, what's the guy's name? Bernie Madoff. All right. And you can increase the net operating income, which increases the value. So if you raise rent to $10 a month in a 10 unit apartment building, it raises the NOI to $12,000 per year. Do the same thing for a 50 unit apartment building. That is a $60,000 increase just by raising the rent 10 bucks. With stocks, you can't control anything on what and how the company makes decisions. With stocks, the company can go bankrupt, as I mentioned, fraud. I mentioned about Bernie Madoff. Now, with stocks, not all pay cash dividends either. You only realize the, the income when you sell the stock. But if you do have a stock that gives you dividends, of course, you can get paid that way. With stocks, their value is up and down like a roller coaster. All right. How would you know what is truly a good buy when there are hundreds of articles telling you if it is a good investment? Owning an apartment building is like an employee working for you. Think about that right there. It's like an employee working for you. People's first priority out of any bills to pay rent. It's kind of like the Maslow hierarchy of needs. The very first thing before a car payment or anything else, it's a human nature to say, you know what? I have to take care of my living situation first. I have to have a roof over my head before anything else takes place. Now, I'm here in the Bay Area and housing is extremely expensive. A lot of people can't afford to buy. But once again, they have to live somewhere. So if they can't afford to buy, where are they going to live? Apartments. Uh, look at it this way. Typically, the biggest expense in a household is rent. When your tenants go to work, they basically work to pay your mortgage on the apartment. As they pay the mortgage, equity rises. Then once the loan is paid off, all revenue will go to you and not the bank. So I'm going to wrap this up. Remember the story I told you about Alex Spaniels? He made a lot of money providing services for the farmers. And to limit his liability and taxes, he turned to real estate. The real estate empire his family has still, from today, it started from apartments. 
when you own an apartment building, it's like an employee working for you. People will take care of this before any other bill. If you get sick and can't earn a paycheck from your job, your apartment building is working for you. Most of this income may not be subject to Social Security taxes, Medicare withholdings, and in some cases, no tax at all because of your ability to depreciate a property value, and then you can defer the claims and you can roll it over to a 1031 tax exchange. Now, here is the logical reason why I invest in apartments. Apartments are ideal. Now, I started my talk with understanding logic. Here's something I found online. Okay, or kid. Well, it's going to come up. But this is the little acronym. It's called IDEAL. Income. Mailbox money that comes in each month. Oh, shoot. A depreciation. Paper loss. IRS allows you to deduct from your active income. Equity. Increases when tenants pay the rent on your mortgage. Appreciation. Could be forced through increasing income and lowering expenses. Leverage, pay only 20 or 30% to control over 100%. Now, here's this thing I found online. I thought it was hilarious. Explain how you figure out how much milk they drink. Kids are so funny. Well, this is, this is it of my presentation. I have a lot more information to share on my website, smallapartmentinvestors.com. And if you would like to buy or sell an apartment building in the Bay Area, um, you can also check out the brokerage that I'm with, RECPG, Commercial Property Group. I hope this has been good for you. Uh, educate you some things that you did not know. And um, contact me if you have any questions. Adios.